uh, defeats. But brothers and sisters, we know that God wants His children to be victorious. In fact, let me read these words for you from the pen of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans. I'll just read this for you and just uh, hang on the words, okay? Romans chapter 8, 31 to 37. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You know, Jesus Christ is praying for us even right now. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than what? We are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. Now friends, it's either that's true or it's not true. Only two choices. It's either these words that we have read are true or they're not true. In fact, I'd like to find out right now, how many of you actually believe these words? Can you raise your hand? Those who actually believe these words. We are more than conquerors in Christ. And so God wants us to live victorious lives. There's so much ahead of us in 2015. And so what we want to accomplish in this uh, first Sundays of 2015 is to just get those principles that would somehow guide each one of us so that indeed we can live a successful life this year. Now, of course, every new year, there's a lot of New Year's resolution. And again, that's an indicator that we want this year to be better than last year. People want to be successful, whether it's winning friends or making money or getting a promotion or losing weight. Whatever it is, we want to be successful. And brothers and sisters, the Bible is the original book that talks about success. It's a manual that can guide us into victorious living. And again, as I've said, if you research the word success in the Bible, almost quickly you will find yourself in the book of Joshua. Because that's the topic in the book of Joshua. Joshua is about to embark on a new phase in his life. The challenges that he's about to face are daunting. It's beyond his ability. He is about to enter a, into a crossroad. And all of us friends, at one point in our lives, will enter a crossroad. Now what is a crossroad? One dictionary definition says, a crossroad is a crucial point, especially where a decision must be made. It's a crucial point where a decision must be made. So there are those critical junctures in our lives that necessitate life-changing decisions. Now some crossroads will enable us to make some preparations, like getting married. You know, that's a major crossroad, getting married. You're on the road and you're carrying a cross. <laughs> no, but it's a major transition but at least it gives you some time to prepare for it. And some people, they wait for a year or two or three years or however it, uh, it takes just for them to set their minds and their hearts to this commitment. Now, other crossroads, they intersect our lives unexpectedly. Like a sudden news of death in the family, sickness or a loss of job, now, definitely crossroads are challenging, they are risky, sometimes painful, but always shapers of character. Crossroads are strengtheners of conviction. Whenever we get into a crossroad, it reveals who you really are. 
Somehow it, it unmasks you. It tells you what your priorities really are. And so again, I thank the Lord that uh, when facing life's crossroads, we have the book of Joshua. The first nine verses, I'd like for all of us to please stand. We will read all, all of us this. We will all read this together. Joshua chapter 1, verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 to 9. Ready? Read. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses came. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised to Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and righteous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray. <coughs> Almighty God, we, we have read, we have heard these words. <coughs> and Lord, we know that this is actual history. We know that you moved in the life of Joshua. We read about his success. We read about his courage. We read about his victory. But Father God, Lord, our prayer this afternoon is that we will not just read this in our Bibles, but Lord, we will actually experience this in our lives. Almighty God, we do not know what is in store for us this year, 2015. There will be challenges out there. There will be uh, changes out there. There might even be a crisis out there. But Father God, Lord, we truly want to come out victorious in all these ordeals, in all these difficulties. And so Father God, Lord, may you impress upon our hearts the things that you want us to learn. Something that we can take home with us. Something that we can nurture in our hearts and get ourselves ready to face 2015. And so, Father God, Lord, we just submit ourselves to your Holy Spirit now. Remove any hindrance now, Lord. Cover us with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can we take your seats? So what we read here in the first three verses of Joshua chapter 1, what we read here is a crossroad. At least in the life of Joshua. This is where we find the passing of the baton from Moses to Joshua. And you know, as well as I know, this is not an easy task for Joshua. I mean, when you hear the name Moses, Wow! I mean, so many images would come to mind. Replacing a man who spoke with God face to face. Replacing a man whose face showed, whose countenance showed the glory of God. Wow! You can just imagine the knees of Joshua trembling with this transition in his life. And so we want to learn how he was able to accomplish the task that God gave him. I mean, all of us, we tremble 
at the thought of doing a transition. You know, whether it's a journey from being single to being married, whether it's from one job to another, whether it's from one location to another, from being a high school student to a university student, we, we are so afraid of the transition. Why? Because every transition means change. And change causes apprehension. Because we're living something that is familiar, and we move into the territory of the unfamiliar. And so fear can be a real problem. And I, I, I'm sure you've noticed in the first nine verses how many times the Lord told Joshua, Fear not, be courageous. Three times in these uh, nine verses. And so how we handle transition and how we face our fears will determine our success as we enter a crossroad. And so let's walk with Joshua going through a crossroad, going through a transition. And uh, it can be very confusing at times, especially a transition or a crossroad. So many signboards to look at when you're at a crossroad. And here we find Joshua about to fill in the shoe of the man who is the undisputed leader in Israel. He's about to stand in the shadow of a leader who, is the, who was a, a colossal figure in the history of Israel. Joshua is about to take the place of Moses. I mean, imagine the pressure. Imagine the expectations of the people. You know, if you go back to those years when Michael Jordan was still playing with the Chicago Bulls, try to imagine you're part of the team of the Chicago Bulls and then Michael Jordan got hurt. Last five minutes, the score is tied. And then your coach said, you replace Michael Jordan. Wow! Try to imagine the pressure, the expectation. And yet, friends, I tell you what's about to happen here is nothing compared to what replacing Michael Jordan is all about. This is Joshua asked to replace Moses. Now, what qualification would you need to replace a man like Moses? You know, every job has certain qualifications. Some jobs require simple qualifications. You know, if you can breathe, if you're still alive, you're high. Very simple qualification. But other jobs, they demand complex qualifications. And I mean, let me just be honest with you. Take pastoring, for example. I mean, after 13 years of being a pastor, 10 years in the Philippines and then 3 years here in Canada, I can assure you, it's one of the most demanding jobs in the world. The Bible, in fact, says that pastoring is a gift. That means if you don't have the gift and you try to be a pastor, then, wow, that will be a sure headache. You'll struggle all throughout because there are certain abilities that are necessary to accomplish the task. I mean, you need to have some administrative skills, you need to have some decision-making skills, you need to have some delegation skills, you need to have some teaching skills, preaching skills, counseling skills, managerial skills, vision casting skills, leadership skills, and most important of all, you need to have people skills. It's a great balancing act to be a pastor. And I thought of what Richard Dehan once wrote, the struggle of being a pastor. You know, he wrote this word several years ago. And, uh, I mean, he wrote this in a funny way, and it's exa ex exaggerated, I'm sure, but there's some truth to this. So, here's a struggle. Try to picture the struggle of a pastor. It says here, if the pastor is young, he lacks experience. If his hair is gray, he is too old for the young people. If he has five children, five or six children, he has too many. If he has no children, he is setting a bad example. If he preaches from his notes, his messages are cut and dry. If he preaches without notes, he isn't studying. If he pays attention to the poor people, he is playing to the grandstand. 
If he pays attention to the rich, he is trying to be an aristocrat. If he uses too many illustrations, he neglects the Bible. If he does not use enough illustrations, he is in clear. If he condemns wrong, he is cranky. If he doesn't preach against sin, he is a compromiser. If he preaches the truth, he is offensive. If he doesn't, he is a hypocrite. <laughs> if he fails to please people, he is hurting the church and ought to leave. But if he pleases everyone, he doesn't have any convictions. If he drives an old car, he shames his congregation. If he drives a new one, he has his affection set on earthly things. <laughs> if he preaches all the time, people get tired of hearing one man. If he invites guest preachers, he is shirking responsibility. If he receives a large salary, he is a mercenary. If he receives a small salary, it proves he is in poor much anyway. <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's exaggerated, that's for sure. But there's some truth to that. The struggle of uh, doing a pastoral job. Now, I know some of you have already read the letter, my personal letter, uh, and inserted into the bulletin. And uh, again, I'm just going to uh, address that a little bit throughout this uh, sermon. But uh, basically, it's an admission that I don't have the the gifting of a pastor, I can preach, I can teach, but you know, the pastoring task is, is so much bigger than just teaching and preaching. And somehow after three years, I've seen that uh, we were able to bring this church to a certain level, but to bring it to another level, it's beyond me. And so I really thank God for Pastor Jerry for at least giving me this chance for three years to try it out. But as I'll be sharing with you, the uh, calling that I had even before coming here to Canada is doing training, seminars and training uh, through the Paul's project. But going back to Joshua, being asked to fill the shoes of Moses. If there's one emotion that is very clear being addressed in these first nine verses, it's the emotion of fear. That intimidating, terrifying, paralyzing fear. And so God had to talk to Joshua. I mean, the guy needs guidance as to how to go about this major crossroad, this crucial transition, this critical juncture in his life. And this passage that we've just read, we read about God's counsel to Joshua. And you know, as a result of this pep talk with Joshua, this huddle with Joshua, Joshua overcame his fears and came out victorious, accomplishing the task. So would you like to listen to what God told Joshua? We have it here, the first nine verses. In verse 6, it says here, Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. First of all, in your outline, friends, try to fill this up. Facing life's crossroads involves courage to do the will of God. Facing life's crossroads involves courage to do the will of God. You know, courage is something that we cannot do without. When you're making a transition, when you're in a crossroad, you need courage. And we see this highlighted throughout the scriptures. Men and women who were mightily used by God, they had to, had to have courage to do it. For example, what did Daniel demonstrate when he refused to worship Nebuchadnezzar's statue in Babylon? He demonstrated courage. Next, what did David have when he faced Goliath in the valley of Elah? armed only with his sling. Friends, he had courage. Next, what did Elijah show when he faced the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? Friends, clearly he showed courage. And then, what did Moses use when he stood against Pharaoh and refused to be intimidated? Well, definitely, he had courage. He had courage. I'm sure we all understand courage. The word has several synonyms in English. We have the word bravery, 
We have the word valor. We have the word fearlessness. We have the word heroism. And then today we use the word guts. You know, he has guts. He's a gutsy guy. You know, he's a courageous guy. In Tagalog, of course, nandiyan yung... Uh, what are the words of Tagalog? I don't know so much Tagalog. But I know in Cebuano. In Cebuano, it's kaisong. Huh? Kalikon. Milnikog barong. Gayong bukong. Likon ng lugan. Bagaw now. Ito na nga. Not including the last one. But, uh, you know, there are those words that we can use to uh, describe courage. But what description I love about courage is this one. Courage is like a tea bag. You never know its strength until or unless it's in hot water. Courage is like a tea bag. You never know its strength until or unless it's in hot water. Now, isn't that true? Unless we are in a crossroad, unless we are in a tight situation, that's when real courage comes out. And so courage is that inner strength, the determination to hang on, to persevere, to withstand hardship. And God knew that for Joshua to go through this crossroad, for him to accept the job of replacing Moses, for him to lead the people to occupy the land, he's got to have courage. And that's why three times in these nine verses, God said to Joshua, verse 6, be strong and courageous. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. And then verse 9, be strong and courageous. Let's take them one by one. And let's see here what would help us develop this kind of courage. First of all, it says in verse 6, Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Brothers and sisters, write down in your outline, courage is in ignited by God's purpose. Courage is ignited by God's purpose. When you hear God's call, when you sense God's purpose for your life, friends, when it's clear that it's coming from God, you know, not a push from your wife, no, not, not the pressure from the community, you are sure it's God's voice, there's a call, and there's a purpose that He wants you to accomplish. Friends, that's what ignites courage. And again, the, the ministry of the Paul's project is, is just so amazing the way the Lord has led me this far. You know, when I took up my doctoral studies in North Carolina, my dissertation is to how to help pastors, Filipino pastors in particular, develop expository sermons. And then, out of that 300, more than 300 pages of dissertation, I was able to produce a manual of about 100 pages on how to help pastors study the word accurately and then preach the word adequately. And so that was the birth of the Apollos project. And of course, the name Apollos there is because of uh, the Apollos guy, you know, in the book of Acts. And uh, if you've been through the Apollos project, you know exactly why we came up with that name, the Apollos project. And so now we have three levels. There's level one, and that's hermeneutics, seven, seven hours. And then another level, level two is exegesis, another seven hours. And then level three, we have homiletics, another seven hours. And so I've been conducting this seminar in uh, different places, and I'm just, I'm just amazed the way the Lord has opened doors of opportunity for me to conduct seminars even in places where there are no Filipinos in Kenya, it's all Kenyans. In Zambia, it's all Zambians. And then, of course, in, in Cuba, all Cuban pastors. And yet, you know immediately, you know, the, you know how you will know if your people are really getting into you, if they're really catching what you're saying, they laugh at your jokes. You know, if your audience can laugh at your jokes, you know you got them. You know you're making a connection. And Africans and Cubans, you know, they laugh at my jokes. And I said, wow, this is something good. <laughs> so these people, it's not just for Filipino mindset. These people are really uh, seeing the need. And you know, there's no one place here where I went where they did not want me to come back. 
And I just have to hold back because, you know, in some of these places, I have to raise my own money. I have to raise money for Kenya, for Zambia, for Cuba, you know, in other places. But, again, resources. It's not easy. And so since 2005, when we launched this uh, ministry, up to today, 16 countries so far, and now that the manual has been translated into Spanish, this will open up South America, and there's so much ministry in South America. And so, in verse 7, not only is courage ignited by God's purpose when God calls you to do something, verse 7 says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Number two, courage is intensified by God's promise. When you read God's word and you, and you begin to see God's promises, you know, exhorting you to continue to move on, and to accomplish the task that he has given you, you know that's how courage is intensified. The more promises that you get from the Lord, the, the more you want to go for it. Even though there's, there's, uh, there are difficulties ahead. But God's promise is there. And so what happened since 2005 and then this year, I was traveling from, uh, from the Middle East, coming back here, and I just thought, you know, if this airplane would somehow crash and, uh, you know, I die, that's also the end of the Apollos project. And so I have not trained anybody to conduct this seminar. It's just me. You know, there was a time in my mind, the reason why I don't want to train people to do the seminar is because, you know, like if I train people in the Philippines, that means I won't be invited to go to the Philippines anymore because there are people doing it there already. And so, you know, it's kind of selfish. And yet, after the book of Revelation, after we went through the book of Revelation, and I, and I begin to sense that the time is really ripe for the rapture. It's just a few years now that we need to wait. And in fact, this year is very significant. And so I said, Lord, there's got to be a way here. I need to train uh, leaders, people who can do the seminar so that, you know, they'll be on their own. I don't have to go to, go to the Philippines to do it anymore. And so this year, on my 54th birthday, I was asking God, Lord, please speak to me. You know, courage is intensified by God's promise. Lord, can I get a word from you? What is it that you really want me to do? And so I, I thought about it. And uh, at 54, you know, I thought, uh, uh, outpour at 54, you know? Kasi bisaya outpour, 54, you know? And so... What is it? And then, you know, I, it, it's like God uh, talking in an audible voice, read chapter 54. And I said, chapter 54? What are the books that has chapter 54? So I started from the book of Genesis. There's no 54. Exodus, there's no 54. You know, I, I, I went through these books. There's no 54. Except in the book of Psalms and in the book of Isaiah. So the only two books in the Bible that has chapter 54. And sure enough, when I read Isaiah 54, verses 2 and 3, it says there, Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left, your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. And so friends, when I read these words, the words enlarge, stretch, strengthen, uh, lengthen, strengthen, and then especially the word Descendants. I don't have any descendants yet. I don't have anybody who was, who was, who, to whom I passed on the baton, so that if ever I'm out of the, out of the picture, somebody can continue the ministry. I don't have that somebody. I don't have a Joshua yet. And so somehow, because of this, I said in my heart, Lord, this is the time to go for it. And so we decided, you know, I'll share with my wife and my kids that uh, I'm just going to complete my three years of a pastoral scheme here at CLC. So my third year will expire January 31. And so February 1, that's a Sunday. That will be the Sunday that I'll be preaching. And that's the Sunday Pastor Jerry will uh, kind of send off, kind of bless 
there is a work of the Apollos Project. And so that's also the day that I turned over the pastoral work, uh, the overseeing of, the, of this church to Pastor Jerry. And you know, I'm not leaving you an orphan. In fact, I'll be leaving you in a better state. Believe me, if there's anybody who can take this church to the next level, it's Pastor Jerry. No doubt about it. That's his, that's his calling. That's his gifting. It's, it's the, uh, a, you know, the apostolic gift of starting something from scratch and then making it grow. And so I, I'm really excited about this next phase. You know, my wife and I will still be part of the church. The kids will still be here. And then from time to time, uh, if I have an, a, a Sunday that's available, I'll still be preaching. I'm still, in fact, part of the L5, but I won't be handling a, uh, a tribe. I'm part of the leadership of CLC as an itinerant teacher and preacher. And so that's my new designation. And uh, again, I have one concern. I said to the Lord, come February, I no longer have a salary. So Lord, what's your word about this? And again, Psalm chapter 54 answered this. Psalm 54 said, with a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good, for he has delivered me from every trouble. You know, since the time we came here to Canada in 2009, for the first three years, I don't have a church to pastor. I'm just on my own, conducting seminars, preaching here and there. But God sustained us for those three years. And then the next three years, we have the pastoral work here. But I cannot be tied just for salary. You know, God is calling me to a, to a, uh, to a work where I need to see this as my free will offering. Lord, I'm just offering to you my salary. I, I'll just trust you for how you will provide for me and my family. And uh, you know, there is courage because courage is intensified by God's promises. When you hold on to the promise of God, that courage is intensified. It's, it gets ignited by God's call, by God's purpose for your life, but it gets intensified when there is the promise of God. And then verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and do not be afraid. Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Number three, courage is inspired by God's presence. I will be with you wherever you go. You know, that inspires courage, isn't it? If you know that God is with you. You know what is so hard? In the Christian life is when you're doing something and you know for a fact that God cannot be with you in that thing that you're about to do. That's scary, isn't it? But when you're about to do something and you know for a fact that God is with you because God has called you, because God has given you His promise, and because God's presence is with you, I tell you, friends, that inspires courage. And I really thank the Lord for the way things are working out, you know. I praise God that our church, CLC, is not the regular type of a church. You know, in a regular church, everything is dependent on the pastor. So that if the pastor resigns or if the pastor falls away, the church is, you know, it breaks up. That's not the way CLC works. You know, we work through leadership. There's a tribe leader. In fact, you're attached to them than, the, than you are attached to me. You're attached to your tribe leader. The reason why you're here is because you're tribe leader, not because of the pastor. No, I know there's some because the pastor is handsome. You know, I know you come here. <laughs> I already got that letter from that person and Judy's not here, but you know. But uh, it's a different system that we have here. It's not dependent on the personality. It's not dependent on the pastor. Moses died, but God's purpose moved on. It still continues. It doesn't end. God's purposes does not end with a person. God's purpose will not end with a pastor or with a leader. God's purpose will continue. And so again, we are so thankful that God allowed us to go through this crossroad and uh, I still do not know how things will work out, but the courage is there to move on. And one thing is for sure, we want to say with Apostle Paul, 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? Amen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we are here. It's all because of Him. It's not because of anybody else, but it's all because of Him. Secondly, so first of all we see here, facing life's crossroads involves courage to do the will of God. And, uh, but you know the problem, a lot of times when people are in a crossroad, when, when they're about to enter a transition, it's so easy to be tempted to back away, you know, to just quit. I'm sure most of us have heard of this saying, when the going gets tough, the tough, huh? the tough gets going, not the, the tough. So I'm uh, missing letter E and then a uh, letter T there. But when the tough, or when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. We've all heard of that, but unfortunately, that's not always true. There are some people when the going gets tough, they just quit. And in the Old Testament, we have a classic example of uh, a person or a group of people who actually, when the going got tougher, they just throw their towels. And I'm referring to a verse tucked away in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 78. And it says there in verse 9, the first half, it says there, The sons of Ephraim were archers equipped with bows. The sons of Ephraim were archers equipped with bows. You know, if there's anything the sons of Ephraim were good at, it's the bow and arrow. They are the best men in the club. They have the sufficient hardware. They have the, the muscle. They have the biceps. And, uh, you know, they have the supplies. They have the skill. But you know what, friends? You cannot judge by what you see on the outside. Because when the going got tough, here's what happened. The second half says, Yet they turned back on the day of battle. Wow! That means on the very first day of enemy encounter, they turned back. You know, as archers, they're supposed to be the front line. They're the first offensive strike. You know, before the armies collide, before they do their hand battle, the archers they have to stretch or bend that bow as far as they could and, and send it out as far as they can so that they can eliminate so many, so many of the enemy before the actual hand battle. The archers, they are our first line of offense. And what we see here, on the very first day of enemy encounter, you know what they did? Wow! They turn back. They run back to the barracks. They got so afraid, like a rat hunted by a cat. They run. Although they are well armed, although they have the supplies, they did not have courage. They did not have the determination. But you know what? When you look at the tribe or the sons of Ephraim, you know, these people, they're very impressive looking. They are a rugged, rugged company of muscular men. You know, no one called them Ephraim during inspection. Their, their sandals show like polished chrome. They love target practice. They love parade and review. But friends, on the very first day of battle, they retreated. The only maneuver they were able to accomplish was waving a white flag. The only weapon they used to restrain the enemy was a cloud of dust as they ran towards the battles. The sons of Ephraim were archers equipped with bows, yet they turned back on the day of battle. You know what? An indictment. You know what this tells us? You cannot judge a Christian by just the way he looks. He may be carrying a big Bible. He may have memorized many verses. But friends, what will reveal what is on the inside is when he goes through a crossroad. When he goes through tough times. When he encounters a problem. That's where you know what type of Christian this person really is. In, in face of temptation, that's what will reveal 
if there's a letter S really there for Superman or still letter S pero sobrang takot and so we see here this uh, these uh, sons of Ephraim you know they're still present in our generation today they're still present in many churches today they're still present in many families today but just like the definition of courage courage is like a tea bag you'll never know its strength unless it's in hot water you'll never know their strength and many people they just buckle up when there's the pressure of life, when there's the hurdle of work, when there's the, hard, the hassle of relationship, and when there's hardship in the Christian life, they cannot handle the pressure, they cannot face the battle. And so, it's easy to say, if it gets hard, let's just quit. You know, students, if you find your class or school boring, let's just drop out of school. And there are students like that. There are employees like that. When the work at the office gets tedious, resign and just find another job. When school is hard and demanding, drop out of school. When the worship service is boring, transfer to another church. When the Christian life gets tough, let's just quit. When business is hard, let's close shop. And so friends, at the end, the end of the day, it will reveal who are the sons and daughters of Ephraim. But I love his words from Chuck Swindoll. He said, there is not an achievement worth remembering that isn't stained with the blood of diligence. Wow. There isn't an achievement worth remembering that isn't stained with the blood of diligence. Also, he said, there is not a victory worth celebrating that isn't marked with the scars of disappointment. To quit, to escape, even to hide, solves nothing. You know, it only postpones a reckoning with reality. And so friends, I don't know what will happen in 2015, but for sure, there will be changes. You'll be one year older this year. There will be challenges. And there might even be a crisis this year. But whatever happens, have courage. Have courage. And allow God to work. And that's why, friends, we believe this. Let's all read this together. Everybody now, ready, we. Courage is found not in the absence of problems, but in the presence of God. Courage is found not in the absence of problems, but in the presence of God. So number one, facing life's crossroads involves courage to do the will of God. So courage is ignited by God's purpose. Courage is intensified by God's promise. And then courage is inspired by God's presence. Secondly, verse 7 now. It says here, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the, left, to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. And then verse 8, here's the key verse for the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8, the most uh, famous verse in Joshua. Verse 8 says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Fill up the blank. Number two, facing life's crossroads includes commitment to dig the Word of God. Not only the courage to do, but the commitment to dig the Word of God. So here we see God commanded Joshua to be strong and courageous and then to make sure that he is obeying the Word of God. Let's break down verse 8. It says there, first of all, keep this book of the law. First of all, book of the law. So that's where you have the portion, the portion that God wants us to keep, and that's the book of the law. Of course, in the Old Testament, it refers to the first five books of Moses, but today we have the whole Bible, 66 books, 
our whole Bible. So keep this book, the portion, and then it says always on your lips. Friends, that's the permanence. The permanence, it says they're always on your lips. That means as Christians, it should be second nature to us. It's, it's like breathing air when we quote verses. What you know what is so sad today? Many Christians today are no longer quoting verses. They do not memorize the Bible. And they do not memorize verses from the... They just rely on their cell phone, you know, because they have the Bible there on their cell phone. And they can just scribble, you know, or, or just uh, go through their cell phone. But it's sad. Because in times of temptation, it's different when you already have it in your mouth. And then you just quote the Word of God in times of temptation. Because when you're already looking at a, at a woman in a bikini, you cannot look at your cell phone and look for the verse. Like, what verse is this? Ah, you You just keep looking at her and it's done. You know, you're already defeated. But if you have memorized it, laid it upon your heart, the moment you see that person, immediately, immediately you can call the verse. So, the permanence, and then meditate on it day and night. Now, that's the process. That's the process. And the word meditate here, the, the equivalent word here is ruminate. Have you, have you come across that word ruminate? You know a, a cow or a goat or sheep, you know, they just ruminate. You know, they would, uh, they would be standing and then they'll be eating grass. The cow keeps on eating grass. They keep on, they don't chew it. They just swallow it immediately. And so they just keep on swallowing, and then their stomach, there's three or four compartments there. They try to fill up those three or four compartments of their stomach, and once it gets filled up, they go to a chain and they sit down, and once they sit down, they have the ability to bring out what they have swallowed already and continue chewing it some more. That's ruminating. To get every nutrients that they can get from it, they just stay in the shade, sit down, and just keep on ruminating. And that's what we need to do when it comes to the Word of God. We meditate on it day and night. We ruminate and get every nutrients that we can get from the Bible. And again, I feel sad because not many Christians today, young people today are really doing it. You know, they just rely on Sunday preaching and that's, that will never be enough. I mean, we struggle throughout the week. And so the process is meditating on it day and night. And then it says there, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. That means, friends, the purpose of rumination, of ruminating it, is so that we may obey. It's not enough to memorize and know the word and explain it. Friends, the goal is to obey. The goal is to internalize the word and then personalize the word. Make it part of your life. That's the purpose. And then here's the promise. Then you will be prosperous and successful. That's the promise. And so here we, we can see how we can experience God's definition of prosperity, God's definition of success, if we stick to the Bible, if we stick to the Word of God. And at least there are five ways you can internalize the Word of God, you know, using the hand illustration from the navigators, you know, the small finger is hearing the Word, the ring finger is reading the Word, the middle finger is studying the Word, the trigger finger is memorizing, you know, that's the fastest finger that we have memorized in the Word, but then what will keep them all together is the thumb, the meditating the Word of God. That's when we personalize the Bible, when we personalize the Bible. David learned this lesson in Psalm 119. Of course, he learned this in a hard way after sinning with Bathsheba. But he said, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word, I seek you with all my heart to do to uh, do not let me stray from your commands. And number seven, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Psalm 199, and then jump to verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. And then of course, the Apostle Paul, before he died, you know a person who's about to die, he's only going to give you words that really matters. 
Yun ang tao mamamatay na hindi na nagtatanong yan. Ano bang teleserye yung mamaya? Wala, kasi wala na mamamatay na eh. Now, first of all, about to die, he will just leave you with words that will really matter. And second, second Timothy's last letter, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does, need, who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. And so friends, we have suggested this before, but let me suggest it again. You can read the Bible devotionally by using spec. Remember letter S? S is sin to avoid. When you read the Bible, try to look for sin that you need to avoid. Letter P are there promises that you need to claim. Letter E is there an example for you to follow. Letter C is there a command for you to obey. And the letter K is knowledge. Any new knowledge about God, about Jesus Christ, or about the Holy Spirit. And so that's devotionally reading your Bible with a speck. A speck in your eye. Now friends, we need to understand that the Bible will not guide us every minute of the day. I mean, every decision. You cannot ask God, Lord, ano bang suka bibili ko, Panginoon? Uh, you know, ito bang suka na to? Ito suka na to? You know, you don't need God's word to uh, determine those kinds of decisions. There are not moral issues. The Bible addresses moral, moral issues. And then the Bible gives us general principles. You know, you can use the Bible like a horoscope. You know, like that, uh, like that, uh, like that uh, young, young uh, lady. There are three guys courting him. And you know, this young lady, three guys, one guy was very tall. The second guy was just about his height. But the third guy was smaller than him. And so, these three are courting her. And so she said, Lord, who should I say yes to these three guys? You know, is it the, the tall, the medium, or the slow? You know, this lower person, this low, uh, lower height. And so, Lord, he just, she opened her Bible like a horoscope. Lord, guide me, Lord, who should I say? Uh, the high, the medium, or the low? And then she closed her eyes and then pointed her finger. And then her finger landed on Matthew 20, 18, 20, 20, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And lo, I will be to always with the close of the ears. And so he said, ah, the Lord wants me to say yes to the lower guy, the lower height. Now you cannot use the Bible that way. You cannot use it like a horoscope. Again, it's all up to you. The Bible, uh, you know, God wants us to be mature sons and daughters. God gives us principles. But you know, all the other decisions, we can make the decision on our, on our own. The only moral issue when it comes to marriage, when it comes to girlfriend or boyfriend, listen to me young people now, the only moral issue here is what it says in 2 Corinthians 6.14, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? The only moral issue is if it's a Christian or an unchristian. It's up to you. You want somebody tall, you want somebody uh, thin, you want somebody, you know, with a master's degree, you want somebody with a car, you know, a character. <laughs> it's all up to you. But that's just that one requirement, the moral issue. Is she a Christian? Is she a Christian? Now, when they say like that, it's not the name of the person. Oh, he's a Christian. His name is a Christian. No, 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 not the name. By heart, all right? He's a Christian by heart. And so, uh, Hebrews 5, 11 to 14, God expects us to know between good and evil, to continue growing. Here's what the writer of Hebrews said. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you are no longer, you are no longer, you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. I'm sorry. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature. Who by constant use, the, the, that's the key word, constant, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And so friends, 
We need to distinguish good from evil and God has given us the Bible as a source of guidance for us. He has given us principles. And again, general principle before, let me share this very quickly. The 6, 8, 10 principle, how to know whether right, whether something is right or wrong. Alright? 6, 8, 10 principle, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 8, and 1 Corinthians 10. First principle, 1 Corinthians 6, it says here, Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And so you need to ask yourself the question, is this right or wrong? If it is enslaving you, like smoking, because of nicotine, it can be enslaving, it can master you, then you know it's wrong. Is it beneficial? You know, if you watch a horror movie, and then you cannot sleep for three nights, you know it's not beneficial. Therefore, it's wrong for you. And so, the first item here is, try to know, is it really beneficial? Is it enslaving? And then, First Corinthians chapter 8, it says here, When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. So what it is saying is this. Here's the principle. You do not make a decision whether something is right or wrong just because it's good for you. You also have to consider your brother or sister who will be watching you. Are you setting a good example to our younger brother? Just because you can take one bottle of beer and you don't get groggy, it's okay, you know, my body can handle it, I will not be driving, one beer is okay with me. But a younger brother who has a weaker, uh, who doesn't have self-control, if he takes one beer that he cannot control anymore, he has to take ten beers, then you have set your brother to sin. So that means, principle number two, not only is it good for you, the next principle is, is it good for the others who might be watching me? Alright? And then finally, 1 Corinthians 10, 6, 8, 10 principle. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, that covers everything, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so will it glorify God? That's the ultimate question, isn't it? That's the ultimate question. Will it glorify God? And so again, we have the Bible to guide us all through our days. And so, facing life's crossroads includes commitment, I'm sorry, includes commitment to dig the Word of God. And we have those words. And then finally, verse 9. Last point here. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Friends, thirdly and lastly, Facing life's, deep, life's crossroads implies conviction to depend on the work of God. It implies conviction to depend on the work of God. God will be with you and you will see how God will work when He is with you. And so that kind of dependence on God if he has called you to do something, don't rely on your own understanding. Don't rely on your own experience. You know, we need to depend on how God's presence will work in our needs. Somebody said, faith is believing the incredible, seeing the invisible, so that we achieve the impossible. And you know, when we need to take that step of faith and really trust God, His presence is with us. Faith is believing the incredible, seeing the invisible, so that we achieve the impossible. And then here's one last quote. As long as there is someone in the sky to protect me, there is no one on earth who could break me. That's God's presence, isn't it? As long as there is someone in the sky to protect me, there is no one on earth who could break me. Again, just assurance, when we go through tough times, when we go through a crossroad, friends, remember God is with you. Deepen your conviction to depend on God's work in your life. I'd like the worship team to join me here now. Again, as I've said, I do not know what is in store for you in 2015. But friends, I know I don't
don't have to be a prophet to know this. But you will have challenges this year. You will have a change this year. You might even have to go through a crisis this year. But whatever it is, friends, remember that God is at work. Be afraid when there's no opposition. Be not afraid when there is one. Because we know that we have an enemy who will try his best, you know, to, uh, to derail us, to give us a detour from the path that God has already set for us. But whatever it is that you are seeing this year, 2015, try to think of that right now because that's what we're going to pray to the Lord after we sing this song. Is there something that you're seeing this year? Is there a crossroad that somehow you're anticipating? Is there this particular need in your life that you want God to address this year? Whatever that need is, whatever that concern is, whatever that desire that you have in your heart, I'd like you, brother and sister, to just take that step of faith, come to the front and say to God, Lord, there is this something in 2015 that I want to settle. Lord, I need to cross over this. Whatever that is, I want you to believe that God is here and He will respond to that need. We just have to take that step of faith and take that seriously when He says, Go. When He says, Go. Let's all stand, shall we? And let's sing with the worship team.
Holy Presence. Lord, we are so conscious of the fact, Lord, that we do not deserve even to come before your Holy Presence. Lord, you know our hearts. Lord, you know our lives. Lord, you know what is in our minds. Almighty God, Lord, you know everything that we have done. And yet, we have the confidence to come before your throne of grace all because of your mercy and because of your grace. And so, Father God, Lord, you know your children right now who see you in front. Lord, you know every need. Lord, you know every desire. Lord, you know every fear and every doubt. Lord, you know what they're asking. Lord, you know what they're deciding in their hearts. Almighty God, Lord, they're seeing this crossroad this year. The so Father God, Lord, we pray. Lord, that indeed as you have given Joshua these promises, Lord, we claim these promises as we go through these crossroads this year. Lord, as we go through a transition this year, Almighty God, Lord, we pray that indeed your purpose will be revealed to us. Lord, guide every step, every decision that we make. Guide us, Lord, we pray. And Lord, we just ask that you'll speak to us through your word. Lord, as we open your Bible. Lord, as we seek your face. Lord, we pray that you'll make clear your, your will to us. And Lord, guide us to what decisions we need to make. And Almighty God, we thank you because you promised, the same way you promised Joshua, Lord, your presence will go with us. And that's why there is victory for us because you are there with us and for us. And so, Father God, Lord, we just commit to you every brother, every sister right now, Lord. Everything, Lord, that they have purpose in their hearts to come before you. Lord, we offer them now on the altar. We offer them now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father God, Lord, you will touch every pain, every hurt. Lord, you just address every need. And Father God, Lord, we pray that indeed we will sense your embrace. Lord, we will sense your hand the right direction and so that this year 2015 indeed will be a better year than last year this year will be a victorious year this year will be a year of fruitfulness and so Father God Lord we pray for abundance we pray Lord for more open doors and opportunities we pray Lord for your favor to be upon our lives Lord in our work in our offices Lord in school Lord we pray that you keep good grades for our students Lord we pray that you keep good health for each one of us and Lord, as we pursue the goals that you have set for us to pursue, Lord, we pray that indeed we will sense your purpose, your presence, your power upon our lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that indeed this year is better than last year. We declare that, Lord. We declare that, Lord. We claim that in Jesus' name, we will be victorious this year. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you have accomplished in our midst, even this afternoon. We commit all of these things. We ask this. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people say, Amen and Amen. Come on, let's give it.